So um, anyway, we got the recording going, just so you all know, everybody's recording, and we'll be muting everybody here in a minute. Um, matter of fact, that I'll do that. You'll have to unmute yourself to talk. Yeah, I know. Thank you, John. I remember that now. Uh, uh, participants. Oh, I have to go up to the big menu. God. So many... Okay, well, I'll do that when I'm done the little presentation here. So please. So anyway, um, thanks for stopping by again. We've now had several of these and they've been very successful. Uh, not only have we had nice attendance live, and it is kind of a, in the middle of the afternoon for a lot of people, so it's hard for people to attend, but uh, we put the recordings of this presentation up on PhotoPXL in a few days, and uh, we've been happy to see um, hundreds of people, usually on the average of 500 to 600 people, uh, dropping in and, and looking at those uh, recordings, so uh, it's been really cool. Today, as you already probably know, we have Steve Gosling as a guest, and um, on April 10th, we have Ian Plant, uh, who will be visiting us. And then on April 24th, Dan Steinhart, who uh, works for Epson. Many of us know him as Dano, but uh, we're not going to be talking about Epson. We're going to be talking about some of the amazing photography that Dano has been doing over the years. Um, he shared his presentation with me the other day, and uh, there's some really cool stuff. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, your host for this um, are myself, obviously, um, Jeff Shiwi who I don't think is going to be online today. Uh, he's out on the West Coast um, doing one of his artistic photo retreats with some notable people and uh, been getting pictures from him. I know you wanted to try to get online, but he might be where he can't do that. Um, John Carcello. John is the originator of, of the photo chats idea. For those of you that don't remember, he started this back in the pandemic. He did it two times a week. I don't know how you did it, John. It's still boggles me when we look at how much work we have to do just to do one every other week, finding speakers and getting the graphics done and getting it all out there and so forth. And then we have Holger who joins us from Germany. Holger has been a uh, part of this. It was his idea to resurrect this photo chat and he's been doing all the artwork for us. He's a very talented graphic artist, um, musician, photographer and everything else. So Holger, thanks for being part of the group. So we have a little team here. And so if, for example, I'm doing a workshop and I can't make it, uh, Jeff or John or Holger will take over as a host. And we, I'm talking to a lot of really cool photographers uh, that I think will bring a very good mix of talent and uh, presentations over the next couple months. So I hope you enjoy the people that we have uh, listed. And next meeting, we'll update it with some of the people that we'll be having in the um, May meeting. I just wanted to remind all of you, um, we still have some room on a Faroe Islands workshop. Steve and I are doing that. And in a couple of weeks, and it's still not too late to sign up. And the Faroe Islands is a beautiful spot. You're not doing anything or just stop doing anything and come with us and join us uh, for this really cool workshop. The price is all inclusive. All you got to do is get there, which is kind of fun. Uh, not an easy place to get to, but uh, I'll be going through Copenhagen, staying there for a day, doing photography, walking the streets and having some fun, and then flying over to the Faroes. And then I have to spend a night in Copenhagen again on my way home. I've still got one spot left on a Palouse workshop in June. Um, if you've never been to the Palouse, it's the Tuscany of America. We have two back-to-back -back workshops, but I only have one spot left on the workshop from June 24th to the 29th. There's only five people in that workshop. We drive around in a big SUV, go places that are really cool, backfields and places other workshops can't go. I still have a couple spots left in Greenland. I have an expedition yacht in Greenland. Uh, we're going to a whole new fjord system. Uh, with a lot of communities and a lot of really cool stuff. We're switched it up this year. Um, so this will be a real expedition, uh, unlike uh, where everybody else goes in Greenland, uh, mainly because the government of Greenland has shut down the Scoresbury Sound um, and put a lot of restrictions on it. So we found a new fjord system with a lot of cool stuff, and it's going to be a real fun trip. And don't forget, I still have fine art printing workshops May 31st to June 3rd and another one October 11th to the 14th. Uh, those have been uh, really fun. Uh, make a lot of prints, learn a lot of things, and uh, everybody's had a great time on those. Uh, John, uh, P John Panazzo from uh, Colorbite and uh, Jeff Shiwi uh, co-teach those with me. We have five different printers uh, in the studio at the Art Center where I'm an artist in residence and a beautiful facility to learn and teach in, and it's a good time for all. And we have two receptions at my home. We're we open up the house. You can see how I handle all my work at my house, in my man cave, 
and uh, just get around and look at my library of photo books and talk photography. So it's a lot of fun. So if you're interested, please think about signing up for those. Okay, so in a few minutes, uh, everybody will be muted. We have little rules just because there's a bunch of us. Uh, please ask any questions you have in the chat, and, and John will be watching that area. And when we get to a certain point, Steve's done his presentation, uh, we'll ask that person to unmute themselves and they can ask the question. When we're done, we'll open up to everybody, can just kind of participate and have a uh, chat about what they're seeing in the world today. Um, I'm thinking it's, you know, there's some pretty interesting new cameras coming online. I'm really amazed. I got an article coming and a video coming real soon on the new Fuji X106. What an amazing camera. I love it. I've got mine. Um, and uh, I think it's just amazing when I've recently gotten some of the numbers of nearly a half a million orders put in worldwide with, I think it can make about 15,600 a month. So um, it's quite extraordinary. It's kind of a TikTok phenomena. Um, so you'll be reading and hearing a little bit about that from me in a very soon future. All right, today's guest, my good friend, uh, Steve Gosling. I've known Steve for many years. Um, when we do workshops together, not only is it an educational time, but uh, there's a few good laughs, and I'm sure that um, I'll be paying the price for some of that today. Um, but Steve is an amazing photographer, uh, very artistic, uh, very thoughtful. Uh, I've been many places in the world, from the top of the planet to the bottom of the planet with Steve. Um, he doesn't take many pictures because while I can take 50 in an hour, he might get one taken. So uh, he's a little slow and meticulous, but uh, does an amazing job. Sometimes his pictures are out of focus. He calls it art, and um, a lot of them are in black and white, and they're extraordinary. And while I poke fun at him, I have uh, the most respect you can imagine for uh, what Steve does and how he does it. Um, so that's it. Uh, let me unshare my screen here. And uh, Steve? Yes, funny. <laughs> Steve, I'm going to turn it all over to you. Let me see, for example, wait before we do that. Let's see if I can mute everybody. I'm going to mute everybody. Okay, everybody should be muted, right? Yep, I think it looks that way. Steve, I have to unmute yourself. There we yep, go. Steve, the presentation's all yours. Go for it, my friend. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thanks for the very kind intro, Kevin. They're the kindest words you've ever said to me or about <laughs> me. So uh, I'm glad it's been recorded because I can hold that against you in the future. Oh, just try. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just let me check. Now, can you see my image? Yes, we can. That's good. Okay, right. Well, if you stop seeing images, you best interrupt me, Kevin, because all I can see is my screen at the moment. So That's fine. Go right ahead. Okay, cool. Well, welcome to everyone and thanks ever so much for, for signing up this afternoon, this evening or this morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I'm going to speak for about an hour um, and there'll be time, I hope, if you can all bear with me for a Q&A at the end where I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'm going to start the talk with one of my favourite photos from the Faroe Islands. Kevin mentioned that we're going back there in a, in a few weeks. This is looking across to the island of Koltur uh, and an incredible storm moving in off the North Atlantic. And you'll see these are the sort of photographs that um, I like to take, which is why I like the Faroe Islands. They say if you don't like the weather there, just wait 10 minutes. Um, this evening, more well, this afternoon, my plan is to show you a selection of my images, all monochrome um, and mainly landscapes, and give you the backstory to each one, or most of them. This presentation is based on the principles that underpin my approach to photography. Now, briefly, they are one, images, I base my images as much as I can on a thought, idea, concept, or emotion. Secondly, I try to photograph what I feel as much as what I see. Um, three, technical perfection is a secondary consideration, and Kevin's already said something about that. Four, I take a reductionist approach to composition. I'll explain what I mean by that. And the last one, I take photographs for me. Um, my aim is to provide you with some insight into how I put these principles into practice. In other words, how do they influence what I do. And so I'll talk about my motivations, what I was thinking, what I was feeling at the time of firing the shutter, what I was trying to communicate, and how I how I tried to do that in the resulting photograph. 
Um, my in intention is to hopefully prompt some ideas for you to reflect on and to consider how what I say could be applied to your own photography. Inevitably, some of the images that uh, I'll show you could straddle more than one of those sections, but I'm not going to be overly purist about it, as you'll see as we proceed. So starting with the images based on a thought, idea, concept or emotion. Uh, when I'm running workshops, I always try to encourage the participants before they release the shutter to consider what's what's the thought, what's the idea that they're trying to communicate to the viewer of the photograph. So the question, why am I taking this photograph, then for me underpins all the subsequent decisions to be made about composition, lens choice, aperture selection, the choice of filters, all the way through to how the, the image is processed. So as an example, this is a photograph taken at the old whaling station in Gritviken in South Georgia, where I went um, when we were running a workshop together, Kevin and I, um, back in 2016. Um, the place is a reminder of earlier times when whalers and sealers virtually wiped out whole populations of wildlife and built factories to process the carcasses, leaving a, a permanent mark on the landscape. And Whatever our views about the um, unmanaged plundering of the seas, it's hard not to be touched by the sense of history at play in places like this. So my prime motivation was to take a photograph that tells a story about this place and about its past. And I po composed to concentrate on two elements, the old wooden boat and the rusting chain previously used to haul in whale carcasses up the ramp. Um, and I've used the repetition of shapes. So you'll see the shape of the chains in the foreground and the bow of the ship sort of echo each other. So I've tried to, to use that device to link the two elements together. I retained the other elements in the frame, the rusting metal tanks, the mountains behind to provide a context. And the image was processed with a sort of warm sepia tone to accentuate that sense of history that I was trying to convey. David Gibson, who's a UK based street photographer, says in his book, The Street Photographer's Manual, doing things deliberately with a clear understanding of our motives always makes for stronger, or at least more interesting work. And I believe if we press the shutter without some clarity about what we're trying to communicate, it's akin to starting a sentence before knowing what we want to say, which is something, as you've noticed, Kevin does quite a lot, but we'll come back to that. Um, if we don't know what our purpose is in taking the image, then I think it boils down to sheer luck as to what story, if any, our photographs tell. This photograph, taken in Iceland back in 2014, and it's of the water, waterfall Detifoss, a huge, mighty waterfall that I think is incredibly difficult to do justice to in a still image. Um, <clears throat> we'd, I'd been there early in the day with a, a workshop group, but I'd found it difficult to get a, a view. This was from the other side of the waterfall that, that I felt um, portrayed the sense of drama at the location in the evening. Uh, we took a trip the long route round to the other side of the waterfall. Light was falling, as you can see by the uh, the moon in the top uh, top left corner of the image. So I had to work quite close, venturing as close to the edge as I dare, because I'm not a great lover of heights. I got this photograph of the water thundering down into the ravine below and the spray coming up from the bottom. And I hope, because this is what I was I was intending, I hope that it communicates the scale the power and the drama of the scene that I was witnessing. Gordon Parks once said, those people who want to use a camera should have something in mind. There is something they want to show, something they want to say. And that's a theme echoed by uh, a UK photographer, a guy called uh, Eddie Ephraims, who in an article published a few years ago now, about 10 years ago, said, as with learning any language, being able to speak it is one thing. Knowing what we want to say with it, how and to whom is another. This photograph was taken in Northumberland, uh, northeast coast of, of England, on Bamborough Beach, uh, when I was running a one-to-one -one with a client. And as we walked around, I asked him to identify what idea 
was he wanting to photograph? So not was the subject, but what was the idea that he wanted to explore? And he said he wanted to examine the interrelationship between the rocks on the shore and the castle beyond. And we agreed to temporarily go our separate ways, come up with our own interpretation of his idea, and then to sit down later and compare how we'd approached it. Um, so I chose to avoid um, a, a, an image I'd taken before, a fairly obvious view of using the rocks in the foreground as a lead into the castle beyond, and instead to make the rocks the dominant dominant feature. Generally, what people do is the castles, the dominant feature, and the rocks are, are sort of coincidental. And my thought was that these rocks were actually the foundation for the castle, probably um, formed some of the material the castle was made from. So without them, the castle wouldn't exist. So I decided to make the rocks the dominant element in the frame. As a workshop instructor or as a tutor running one-to-ones, I can say from hard experience that the hardest people to teach are those who don't know what they want to say with their camera. Um, I always liken it to somebody going to JK Rowling and saying, I want to write a novel. Can you help me? And she says, yeah, sure. What do you want to write a novel about? And the answer is, I don't know. What do you think I should write a novel about? Um, because it, I don't think it's helpful for me to tell people what to photograph, but I can help them with the how. Um, a few years ago, I had a lady who she would you admit that she was at a very early stage of learning about photography. And we were in St. Mark's Square in Venice. And she said to me, what should I photograph? And I had a conversation with her and explained that there's no point in me telling her what to photograph because who was going to tell her next week or the following month or the following year? So what I suggested was that she came up with a, her own one, two or three words that would describe St. Mark Square at that point in time to her so she could then relate that to somebody back at home. And I said to her, let's let's walk around, think about your one, two or three words. And she came up with big, busy and people. So I then had a conversation with her about the various ways that she could portray big, busy and people. And she came up with a with a, an image that was unique to her. It wasn't something you could go buy a postcard of. So I believe if we can do that, if we can consider so what would our one, two or three words be to, to describe our chosen subject or location? Then we're more able to develop our own unique response to the world in front of us. And from there, we can develop our vision, our unique way of seeing the world. And from that, over time, evolves our own photographic style. This photograph was taken again um, on the workshop to South Georgia and Antarctica. It was our first landing on the Antarctic Peninsula proper at a place called Portal Point, a land of snow, ice and cloud. And as I looked towards this wall of snow and ice, I was overwhelmed by the scale of what was before me. And two words immediately came to mind, <clears throat> immense and white. White was easy to convey, but I de deliberated about how I com could communicate the size of the ice wall. There was no reference point. Asking myself, oh, where are seals and penguins when you need them? Um, so I stood for a while. The snow continued to fall. And I was just pondering how I might solve this particular problem when two of our party walked into the scene. I rarely include figures in my landscape. I normally spend hours waiting for people to move out of the scene. Um, but without them, without those two people, this image uh, has no real sense of scale. On seeing the final photograph, friends of mine have said to me it's a very typical Steve Gosling photograph on the basis that it's very minimalist in, in style. And that's something that I'll, I'll come back to. Something a bit different. This photograph was taken in London when I was wandering the streets during a break in a meeting with a client. Uh, I saw the graffiti lion and the shh sign on the right hand side and thought it'd be amusing if I could get someone passing by looking like the lion was able to pounce, was about to pounce on them. I pre-visualized the composition. So I wanted one person in the frame moving from uh, from right to left so the lion could be positioned behind them. <sighs> I wanted the person to be distracted, appearing to be totally unaware of the imaginary fate 
about to befall them. Didn't want any vehicles passing in the shot. This was a, a sort of entrance exit to an industrial area. And I framed it with the sh sign only partially shown, shown. The rest of it said, please beware of our neighbours when leaving this site. Didn't want that bit on there. I waited for about 15 minutes. Couldn't believe my luck when this lady came by completely absorbed in her mobile phone. But I was clear about, you know, even when I was stood there waiting, I was very clear about what I was looking for. Another photo from the Faroe Islands. I find the landscape there very Tolkien-esque. It could have inspired Lord of the Rings. And it's, it's a land seemingly inhabited by trolls, goblins, giants, dwarves. And I was initially drawn by the, in this scene by the low clouds and the light, but I needed a strong foreground to provide some interest. Wandering around, I found the rocks with the face of some large, ugly, mystical creature. And I knew that I had my shot. And this photo is a simple example of what I mean and when I say an image should be founded on a thought, idea, concept or emotion, um, that there's something I, that you want to communicate. Not every message, though, has to have a deep and meaningful message. The prime importance is that there is in clarity, clarity of it, intent on behalf of the photographer. This is a photograph from the Lofoten Islands in Norway. And whilst I've emphasized the importance of being clear in respect of what the photograph is about, I'm now going to contradict myself, sort of, um, because sometimes you have to trust your instincts. There was something drawing me to this scene, the start wire fence in the foreground that was acting as a bit of a barrier to get further into the frame um, and the church and the graveyard beyond. I sensed it was about death, but it wasn't any clearer than that. Was it about my own mortality? I didn't know. I spent some time stood there asking myself, what is this photograph about, Steve? Couldn't really answer that. I was struggling to understand why there was something pulling me back to it. Uh, and I was about to give up when the blackbird, if you just sort of look up to the top right, uh, top left rather area, um, the bird came and landed on the fence and just something in my head said, that's it. That's made the photograph. Um, soon after I returned home, somebody commented that it made them think of the First World War, sort of barbed wire and blackbirds and death. And, and I remembered Sebastian Falk's novel about the horrors of that war titled Birdsong. It seemed very pertinent to my image and at least it gave me a, a sort of working title for the photograph. Not sure it really explains the meaning of the image. You know, was it just a case of post hoc rationalization? I still don't know. But I'm really glad that I trusted my instinct and I fired the shutter because I still find it an intriguing and thought provoking photograph. Perhaps because I don't still don't fully understand it. But it's an important example of photographing for yourself. I think if I'd had an audience in mind, I probably would never have taken the photograph. French photographer Jean Lucif said many years ago, I take photographs of me. If anybody else likes them, that's simply too bad. So on to the next point, photograph what you feel. I now want to talk about the importance to me of mood, emotion and feeling in photographs. My prime, a prime aim with my photography is to communicate what I feel as much, if not more, than simply what I see. And it's a topic that I believe to be fundamental to producing images with impact. Certainly, I find that true for me. Um, if I don't feel something, uh, it's probably not worth getting the camera out. So when I'm looking at a subject or scene, I'm often trying to consider not only what is, is appealing to me visually, but how and how can I make an interesting composition out of it, but also how do I feel? Is this subject, this landscape, generating an emotional response in me? And how do I best communicate that? Don McCullin, British documentary photographer, best known for his images of war, probably, although later in life, he turned to, he has turned to photographing landscapes. He said, photography for me is not looking, it's feeling. If you can't feel what you're looking at, then you're never going to get others to feel anything when they look at your pictures. This photograph was taken on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. The dark mountains, the coolings, the stormy weather and approaching nightfall 
all made me feel like I was going to be overwhelmed by the elements. I looked at the small white cottage and I used it visually as a metaphor for me. Um, I placed the building to be quite small in the frame and kept the rest of the image quite dark to emphasize the elements about to engulf it, which is exactly how I felt. Keeping it as a light object surrounded by darkness, I hope that I created the sense of the, the cottage being a refuge, a safe haven from, from all of those overbearing, overwhelming elements. I'll talk later about my lack of concern for technical perfection, but as a trailer for that, I'll tell you now, this photograph was taken with a small sensor compact through the wet windscreen of my car. Most expensive filter I've ever bought. The images that always work best for me are the ones that tell a story and the ones that go beyond a pictorial representation. I often say that the best photographs are the ones that raise questions rather than provide answers. This photograph is a, is a good example of what I mean about trying to tell a story. It has a deeper underlying metaphor that prompted me to take it in the way I did. On the first morning out on safari in Botswana, me and a couple of friends were lucky to see our very first line of the trip. But I felt quite sad as I watched this forlorn figure walking away from us down a dusty track and alone and into the, alone and into the distance. And I was reminded of the quote in Nick Brandt's book, Across the Ravaged Land. He said, at the current rate of slaughter, there will be no elephants, no lions and no cheetahs left in the vast expanse of the African continent within 15 years. And in this context, I thought the scene before me was very poignant. And the title came to me before I raised the camera to my eye. And the title is The Last Lion. My photographer friends thought I was mad. They were frantically encouraging our driver to circle ahead of the lion so they could photograph him head on. But for me, this image from behind best captured the thought in my head and most importantly, what I was feeling at the time of taking the shot. I've heard many landscape photographers claim that their images are a factual representation of what was in front of their camera implying that the final photograph is a result of total objectivity, unaffected by their presence or their input. I would argue, and I guess I can only argue from my own experience, but I would argue that that's never the case. Take this photograph, for example. It was shot at a weir on the River Nid. The River Nid runs close to where I live, runs through the middle of the village where I live. And I've done very little to the image in terms of in-camera or post-processing manipulation. I photographed what was in front of me. So does that mean that I was totally irrelevant to the process? I hope not. As a minimum, I decided where to place the camera, what lens to use, whether to apply any filters or not, and how to process the file. But more than that, it reflected my feelings on that particular day. It was taken during a COVID lockdown in the UK. Ironically, COVID had quite a positive intact impact on me in terms of taking photographs. You'll see a few taken during COVID um, from three years ago, two, three years ago. Prior to, um, to taking this photograph, I'd gone through a period of feeling quite flat, low mood, low energy levels, not typical of me at all. However, on this particular morning, I was in more positive spirits. And as I stood at the side of the river, watching the water flow, the water touched by the light, witnessing the reflection shifting constantly with its movement, I contemplated how nothing in life stays the same for very long. Everything is in flux and the changing patterns of light and dark in the water reflected the fluidity of life. So I zoomed in tight to create this semi-abstract composition that captures this sense of transience. And it still, you know, two, three years later, absorbs me and lifts my spirit every time I look at it. So there's a lot of me in this image. It's not just about the landscape. In his book, Shadow Light, Freeman Patterson says, a camera always looks both ways. Like all serious photographers, I have to accept and deal with this fact. The reality that my images are as much a documentation and interpretation of myself as of the subject matter that I choose. 
this photograph in spite of what you see on the screen is not a photograph of two trees in the fog it's really about the thoughts i've been having about a good friend of mine who i've known for 35 years uh, i've recently seen a age take its toll on him as a range of health related issues affect his eyesight impact on his mobility and so on so this image is really about the relationship between two friends who have grown old together one in this case recently damaged by the wind wind its broken limb lies on the ground behind it there and i saw it as being consoled by its old friend the branch of the tree on the left reaching out to its companion the composition relies on the isolation of the trees from the wider surroundings so that and the sense of sadness was accentuated by shooting on a on a fairly dull foggy day i believe that the most powerful images are the result of the photographer's input to the process the photographs we produce are usually a result of a dialogue between us and the landscape but I accept that the balance of that dialogue varies. Sometimes the photographer has the strongest voice, at other times the subject. This photograph was taken on a wet and stormy day on a lake called Cromart Water in the English Lake District, where I run my annual classes. And I was actually with one of our participants tonight, Nancy. I'm sure you remember this, Nancy. Um, for I often say, um, oh, sorry, I was attracted to this scene because of the weather conditions. And I often say if I haven't got wet, then I probably haven't got a good photograph because I like to work on the edge of weather systems moving in or away. For that's when we're most likely to get atmospheric and moody conditions. I've been visiting this spot for about 40 years and I've never before witnessed anything as dramatic as this. But my role was essentially to be there find a pleasing composition and fire the shutter in that sense it's a photograph less about me the photographer and much more about the light and the location in contrast this photograph is really much more about me it's a semi small semi derelict rural garage um, located a short drive from where I live and I've driven past it many times over the last 30 years and I've witnessed its slow decline into a, its current state of abandonment, a sad and forlorn sight, a shadow of its former self. And I thought that the elements of decay, rust, textures of rotting wood might make it an interesting place for, to photograph. As I was walking around, uh, I realised how in better days it would have looked just like the petrol stations that I visited on trips out in my granddad's Ford Anglia back in the 1960s. And with that in mind, I thought it was sad that all that was left behind from those busier times is what you see here. And that my thoughts led me to consider how much I've changed in the last 58 years. And I began to reflect on and question just how much of that 10 year old boy is left inside this 68 year old man. So the title, What's Left Behind, is both a statement about the garage and a personal question, one that I'm still answering. John Sarkovsky, the former director of photography at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, wrote about two different conceptions of what a photograph is, describing them as two ends of a continuum. Is it a mirror? He asks, reflecting a portrait of the artist who made it, or a window through which one might better know the world. And I found this distinction between a photograph being a mirror or a window to be very useful in understanding my own motivations for taking particular photographs. For example, as I pointed out, photo of Cromart Water very definitely on the window end of that continuum, but the photograph of the garage, much more of a mirror, a reflection about me. Whereas this photograph, probably sits somewhere in the middle. Another COVID um, photograph um, taken in the, our first lockdown in the UK in 2020. And I was exploring my local woodland. We were allowed to exercise, I think, for 20 minutes um, as a form of relief and distraction from what was going on in the world. I would go there, often walking my dog, find a patch of light where the sun was breaking through the canopy of leaves overhead, stand with the sun on my face, with my eyes closed 
and listen to the birds and the wind blowing through the, the leaves. With no background hum of distant vehicles, the sounds of nature were intensified. And I'm sure we all experienced some of that during COVID. It was rejuvenating. And in the face of everything going on around the world, this small area of woodland became my oasis of tranquility, the title of a subsequent book containing these photographs. Um, and it's the place where I went to recharge my spirits. This image of a newly emerging fern leaf is both a symbol of my connection with the location, a metaphor but an emotional level for my hope for a sign of better times to come, so a mirror, and also a visual response to the shapes and patterns of the leaves, a window. I believe that the most powerful images are the ones where we have an emotional response to the subject or we feel passionately about it. As I said before, if I'm not stirred by what's in front of my camera, there's probably not much chance of me producing an image with impact. That could be love or hate, but I need to feel something usually. As photographer Ruth Bernhard once said, if you're not passionately devoted to an idea, you can make very pleasant pictures, but they won't make you cry. And one of my favourite folks for her quotes on photography, W. Eugene Smith, who said, what use is adequate depth of field without adequate depth of feeling? This is another photograph taken close to my home on a cold winter's evening as the fog rolled in along the, the river. And I'm fortunate enough to live in rural Nidderdale in North Yorkshire and I absolutely love the countryside around me. It's a landscape that moves me, inspires me, energises me. And every day, whether I'm out with my camera or walking my dog, I'm reminded of how much I enjoy the beauty that surrounds me. I love the mood and the atmosphere of this scene. I stood there a while drinking it all in before lifting my camera to take this particular photograph. Another photograph um, taken locally, the River Nid, which gives the dale where I live its name, winds its way through the dale for about 50 miles and is lined by photogenic trees for most of its length. It's a symbiotic relationship. The river sustains the trees and their roots in turn provide a structural framework reinforcing the riverbank. And I wanted to photograph that close interrelationship between the two, as well as the beauty in the structure of the branches in winter. I could have chosen a fairly standard pictorial representation of that, but that just felt a bit too safe, a bit too predictable. I think it's important that if we have an idea to think about beyond the first idea we have, um, to look for something beyond the obvious. So as you can see, I decided to go for a more abstract approach to just concentrate on the reflection of the filigree of tree branches in the river and to exclude anything else other than reflection from the frame. So there are no real trees, if you like, in this particular photograph. Without both the trees and the water in this image, um, oh, sorry, without both the trees and the water, this image couldn't exist. And I felt that reducing the photograph to just those two elements strengthened the message that I was trying to convey. Okay, on to the fact that technical perfection is a secondary consideration. Um, and this is one of the photographs that when I first met Kevin back in 2011, um, he, um, he took the rise out of me. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's square, it's not in focus, um, it's black and white, you know, all, all, the, all the things that he didn't think it should be. Um, so I'm not interested in technical perfection for its own sake. I was re recently watching a video with Alex Soth, the Magnum photographer, and he argued that photography is not about technical perfection. It's actually about finding your own voice. This photograph was taken over 20 years ago, one of my best selling prints, although the image is not technically perfect. It's not overly sharp, for example, due to the inherent nature of the camera that it was taken with. Um, for the photograph was shot on film using a wooden and brass pinhole camera, just a wooden box with a hole in the front. So no lens, no shutter, no viewfinder, no autofocus, no exposure meter, and therefore not a histogram in sight. Um, so using this simple camera over a period of time forced me to concentrate on developing my vision 
to find a way of expressing what I wanted to say through the medium of photography, in South's words, to find my photographic voice. My focus, no pun intended, my jokes are normally worse than that, um, was concentrated on the images, not their means of production. And as a result, I wasn't distracted by concerns about technique and equipment. Sometimes simplifying the choices available to us makes the process of producing an image much easier. I certainly find that to be the case. And I know that what you see in my photographs today is down to my time using that pinhole camera how I see the world, the style of image I produce, how I like to work, all became clearer to me as a result of that experience. I would much rather have a photograph that has mood and atmosphere than a technically perfect image that fails to convey any emotion. So I'm primarily interested, I don't want this to sound pretentious, but I'm primarily interested in photography as an art form, a way of communicating subjective storylines that are more personal expressions of my interests and how I see the world. I'm always striving, not always successfully, to go deeper than this is pretty. To produce a photo, no matter how technically good it may be, simply as evidence that I've been to an iconic location A or B. I want things to go a bit deeper than that if I can. Guy Tal, writing in Lenswork magazine, said the aim of art is not literal transcription, but rather to offer useful metaphors, aesthetic experiences as suing out of sensory perceptions. This photograph was taken in Venice, reputedly the most haunted city in the world, and it's one of a series that I've been working on to convey the mysterious ghostly aspects of the city. Technically perfect, it's not. Kevin knows me well, so he'll know that this there's a sort of perverse element to this photograph in that it was taken with a Leica M10 monochrome with a 50mm summicron lens, a combination capable of incredibly sharp results. But I took this deliberately out of focus. It was inspired by the 1970s film Don't Look Now, in which Donald Sutherland chases a hooded figure around the dark alleys of Venice, thinking it's his dead daughter. Now, I don't want to spoil the end of the film for you, but it is quite old, so I suspect um, you would have seen it if you were going to. Um, because at the end, it turns out the figure is actually a wizened old lady who ultimately stabs him to death. I get inspired by some wonderful things, as you can see. Brooks Jensen. Hi, Brooks. <laughs> In his book, Letting Go of the Camera, and I was going to say this anyway, but I'll particularly say it now. Brooks is listening in. A fantastic book, a book and that I've read um, two or three times. It's um, it's a very inspiring book. And he says, not every picture needs to be tack sharp. Not every picture needs to have smooth tones. Not every picture needs to be absolutely grainless. In fact, what is important is not detail in the image, but detail in the sentiment. And as Ansel Adams said, there's nothing worse than a sharp picture of a fuzzy concept. Um, which brings me back to my very first point in the presentation, that photographs are likely to be stronger if there is clarity about the thought, the idea, the concept or emotion underpinning them. This photograph was taken at Durdle Door in Dorset, south coast of England, again with my pinhole camera. As I stood on the shore, watching the windblown clouds scud across the sky and listening to the sea rolling onto the beach, I thought about how those elements had sh over time shaped that scene in front of me, created that rock arch. Knowing that the pinhole camera with a fixed aperture of f138 would give me an exposure of several seconds, I framed the photograph to emphasise the sea rushing onto the shore and to record the effect of the wind on the clouds above. For me, this photograph with its sense of movement best captures the energy, the motion, and the power of the forces that sculpted this particular landscape. So to conclude this section on technical perfection, um, or not, um, I mean, my advice is pursue technical perfection when it's an important element in the communication of your ideas, but, but please don't see technical perfection as an end in itself. What camera you use, how many megapixels it's got, how sharp your lenses are, are all secondary to producing photographs that are authentic and honest in the sense that they come from your heart and your soul. Sharp images 
Large images mean absolutely nothing if they don't express something about you, your feelings, your passions, your ideas. This photograph was taken one evening during winter when I wandered down a nearby lane, camera in hand, looking to find a photograph for a project that I called Another Day. Basically, it was an image a day for 365 days. And um, it was starting to go dark. And uh, I told my wife I was heading out with my camera to get a photograph. And she gave me a deadline of 20 minutes to be back, or she threatened to put my dinner in the dog. Um, despite this pressure, the voice of experience told me to relax that there would be a photograph out there somewhere if I kept my heart and my mind open to all the possibilities. So reaching the end of the lane, beyond any man-made illumination, I looked towards the moon through the branches of the trees. The trees appeared to be reaching upwards as if they were trying to clutch the moon from the night sky. I felt the scene look quite sinister and eerie, quite spooky. So I took my photograph and I'm pleased to say that I got home before my dog got the dinner. The photograph was shot handheld, 40th of a second, lens wide open at f1.7 and an ISO setting of 25,000. All of these factors could have had a detrimental effect on image quality and true, looking at the image at 100% on a computer screen, it's noisy, but in a black and white file, that digital noise for me looks like film grain and actually I think enhances rather than detracts from the mood of the image. Now moving on to composition. Those of you who know me will know that I generally take what I call a reductionist approach to composition, removing from the frame rather than adding more in. My usual question is, how much more can I take out of the photograph and still retain the essence of what I'm trying to communicate? And I'd like to show you three very different images to demonstrate what I mean. This photograph taken on a winter trip to New York a few years ago, and the day we went to the Brooklyn Bridge, it was damp, miserable, with light rain falling constantly. I was getting frustrated because I was having to keep wiping the rain spots from the front of my lens. But I loved the graphic nature of the structure of the bridge and knew that I couldn't leave without getting a photograph. Um, like everyone else, I'd seen many photographs of the Brooklyn Bridge before, but I wanted something a little more personal, something that reminded me of my time there, not a generic image that could have been taken by anyone at any time. I noticed the guy walking with his umbrella up, so I waited until he was in the right place for the composition I had in mind, framing it to include the distinctive tower of the bridge and the man's umbrella and just the umbrella, not him. I didn't want a photograph of some random guy on the Brooklyn Bridge. I just wanted a photograph that said, wet day on the bridge. I'm usually drawn to the simplicity, simplicity sorry, of minimalist compositions. In this context, the words of Austrian photographer Ernst Haas resonate strongly with me. He said, the less information, the more illusion, the less prose, the more poetry. And also Michael Kenner, when he says in an interview in George Barr's book, Why Photographs Work, I am drawn to suggestion rather than description. Details do not greatly interest me. This photograph is another one from the English Lake District at a lake called Derwentwater. Taken early on a bright, misty morning, and I found the scene before me to be calming and restful. But I was just looking at an empty lake, really, just looking across to the far shore. But then the kayaker came along and he stopped in the frame, seemingly also absorbing the stillness of the atmosphere. And I thought, I have my shot. It felt like a tranquil moment in time. Um, that I was sharing with him. And that's the mood I've tried to recreate in this photograph. And it's an image reduced to three elements, the bright misty light that creates the high key effect, the relatively still water, and the kayaker giving me the much needed focal point. When I went to Botswana, I knew that I wanted to avoid coming home with lots of pretty colorful tourist snaps of animals, but I had to stick to my own approach to remain true to my vision. That meant concentrating on monochrome, graphic, minimalist images and not getting sidetracked or panicked, which is very easy to do when you're in an unfamiliar place, likely to only go there once in your lifetime. I didn't want to get panicked into taking record shots that said nothing about my personal response to the wildlife and the location. 
And this image is a good example of me putting that into practice. So I take photographs for me. At the time of pressing the shutter, when I took this particular photograph um, and a lot of my photographs, I gave, give no thought or concern as to whether someone else might like the photograph or not. I'm not trying to please an audience, real or imagined. I'm taking photographs simply to please me. This was another shot from the Faroe Islands and the idea behind it was the centrality and the importance of the local fuel station to remote communities. Outside the main towns, the population is widely dispersed across 17 islands. People live in small communities, often isolated from each other by geology, geography and the weather. These gas stations not only sell fuel, but also all the other essentials for life, clothes, food, cooking utensils and so on. I thought this photograph gave a different perspective on the Faroese landscape, so I took it, thinking it would probably only be of interest to me. Ironically, I've subsequently sold prints of this image, and it's also won an award in an international competition um, that attracted 6,000 entries from 69 countries across the world. And I say that not to inflate my ego, but to prove that after 60 plus years of taking photographs, I still have no idea at all how individuals react to the images that I take. I've read many times in photo magazines over the years that I should really be taking photographs that I know will sell. But after all these years, I still can't answer that question. And I, yet I still read advice to give them to freelancers that they should shoot what the market wants. And I used, I used to worry about that until a few years ago, I came across a quote from a lady who is a specialist photo marketing consultant. And she argued that photographers who constantly worry about the market lack confidence in their own photographic vision. And her advice was take what you like and then find a market. And those um, who know me will know why this quote from her appealed to me. She said, here's an open secret. For every possible photographic vision, there is a market. She went on to say, I don't care if you shoot cross-processed insect porn. Somewhere there's a market for it. Personally, I've never taken cross-processed insect porn, but I guess you should never say never. Um, this photograph um, received an honourable mention in that um, international competition I talked about before. And it's of, well, it was taken in the context of witnessing two male elephants play fighting in the river a very short distance from our, our boat. Um, their prowess, prowess as swimmers was, was amazing and a real surprise to me as somebody who's not uh, a wildlife photographer. Underwater, they moved, they moved with efficiency and grace and used their trunks like snorkels. So I decided to use my 600mm lens to go in tight and just concentrate on that trunk emerging from the water. It captures only one element. It's a simple, minimalist photograph, but it captures the essence of the whole experience for me that I witnessed. Um, I certainly wasn't contemplating any uh, international recognition when I took it. I was just desperately trying to get a sharp photograph in a moving boat. Uh, I want to share with you a story about this image of an experience that confirmed to me you can't be overly worried about other people's responses to your photos. Um, it, has, it had been used on a, the phase one blog page where I talked about the three P's of landscape photography, planning, patience, perseverance. Someone commented that the third P should have been for parking because the image that I posted had been taken less than 200 meters from where I parked my car. The implication was the photograph I'd posted had no value as a true landscape image because it hadn't involved a lot of physical effort. Now, I, I don't normally respond to negative comments. People are entitled to their to their view, and that's absolutely fine. But I did respond to this post primarily because I didn't agree with the assumption that underpinned the comment. For if effort equates to value, then what about Ansel Adams' Moonrise over Hernandez, one of the most well-known landscape photographs ever taken? He climbed onto the roof of his station wagon, even less than, he you know, walked even less distance than I did to get this. Um, and in the case of this image, it's true. 
I'd only walked about 200 meters from my car to get to the point where I took the shot. But this had been across uneven, boggy ground, wading through patches of water that threatened to fill my Wellington boots. I'd also spent a long time wandering along the lock shore looking for a composition, followed by about two or three hours stood around in the freezing cold, waiting for the light to cooperate. My feet were cold. My fingers were going numb. So little effort. I certainly didn't think so. But does that enhance or detract from the quality or the value of the final image? Of course not. The viewer either looks at it and they like it or they don't. They don't care whether the photograph, the photographer nearly died to get the shot, whether the photographer had to have a foot amputated due to frostbite, or whether it's the photographer, the favorite image of the photographer's mother. They just view it for what it is. It's a photograph and we have very little influence over their judgments. And just to emphasize my point, that we don't have to always suffer to get photographs with impact. This was taken last September, one of my favorite photographs from last year, from the deck of a cottage that my wife and I rented on the Isle of Harris. And I walked all of about 30 feet to get this photograph. In fact, I was stood in my pajamas with my cooking apron on as I had interrupted my breakfast to go and take the shot. As you can see from this photograph here, and it's not a pretty sight. So actually, getting the photograph was more of a hardship for my wife than me because she had to witness me stood outside looking um, sexy like this or whatever. <laughs> so to return to my theme of taking photographs for ourselves, to be constantly worrying about pleasing others prevents us from developing our own artistic voice with the danger that our photographs stay safe and acceptable. Our images then end up as clones of photographs that the world's seen before. And that is just so incredibly boring. Chris Steel Perkins, Magnum photographer, once advised, photograph things you really care about, things that really interest you, not the things that you feel you ought to do. And Andy Summers, photographer and guitarist with the band of the police, not the human new uniform variety, said in a like of video, audience number one is yourself. It's true with music. I make music for me. And it's the same with photography. I'm trying to knock myself out all the time. This photograph, another one from the Faroe Islands taken in a small coastal village called Tjornavik. Now, in this location, understandably, most visitors are drawn to the more iconic views, for example, from the beach looking out to the rock stacks next to the cliffs. But on this visit, I was more interested in the small, intimate details to be found wandering among the tiny houses. And when I saw this, this scene, the title, Home is Where the Heart Is, came to mind immediately. It's a photograph that reflects my personal response to that location, probably something that uh, a lot of people would have walked past unnoticed, and even if they'd noticed it, probably wouldn't have thought it worthy of a photograph. But importantly, it conveys what interested me. As photographers, we must make a decision. Are we looking for accolades and securing likes on social media? Or do we want to explore and communicate more personal narratives that may require some effort, excuse me, effort on the part of the viewer? If it's the former, then we should spend our life photographing sunsets. We'll undoubtedly end up with hundreds or thousands of followers who are only too happy to spend a few seconds of their life looking at our photographs before moving on to the next post on their Facebook feed. Social media likes are more indicative of immediate impact than the true value of a photograph. Conversely, we must learn to accept that the more complex our images and the more metaphorical they are, the smaller our audience is likely to be. Brooks, I'm going to mention again, um, Brooks Jensen in his book, Single Exposures, says being true to your heart is the only way to make really interesting and significant artwork. There is almost no correlation between popularity and creativity. This photograph was taken early in 2021 during yet another COVID lockdown. And the year ahead looked like it would be as bad for business and travel as 2020 had been. I was in a pretty miserable frame of mind, not very optimistic about what the year ahead might hold, and my mood wasn't helped by the damp and grey weather conditions we were experiencing. 
I decided to take my dog for a walk. And as I stood by the edge of the river, looking at the water dripping off the overhanging branches, I thought of the clouds and imagined them sharing my emotional state. Hence my title, When Clouds Cry. I'd like to end my presentation on a positive note and stress that I'm not by nature a miserable person. In spite of the impression you might have got from this presentation, I do occasionally take photographs that come from a positive place. So just before I close, I'll show you a couple of photographs taken within my back garden, so very close to home. And I hope they demonstrate that we shouldn't ignore the photographic potential on our doorstep. This was taken as the cows moved across the field behind my house. And as I saw them walking across, I had the idea of composing the shot to get the back end of one cow on the left side of the frame and the front end of another on the right, sort of implying visually that the, it was the same cow stretching around the frame. I know I have a warped sense of humour, but it made me smile. This was also taken from my garden. And uh, as I left the house to take the dog for a walk, I looked up and saw the birds on the wires and thought they looked like musical notes. I was reminded of a quote by Minor White. One should not only photograph things for what they are, he said, but for what else they are. Fortunately, I always carry a camera when I go out with the dog. So before the birds flew off, I quickly lifted the camera to my eye and got the photo you see here. Okay, I'm going to end my talk with an image from one of my favourite locations in the Faroe Islands, the waterfall Mullafossa. On our workshop in the Faroes, Kevin and I take our group to this magnificent waterfall to, to see it both from the cliff, cliff top viewpoint, where this was shot from, and from the unique perspective at sea level, looking up to it. It's an amazing waterfall that just, as you can see, just falls directly into the sea. <clears throat> there is a mountain and a village um, behind the scene you see here, but the fog was so dense that day that uh, you couldn't see them. So to close my presentation, I hope that by sharing these insights into my thought processes and my way of working, that that will help you reflect on, analyze and develop your own practice. I wouldn't want to imply that I have all the answers or that my way is the right way to the exclusion of others. That would be one, force, and two, incredibly arrogant. Uh, my hope has been to help and encourage you to consider these issues from your own personal perspective in the context of where you are on your own personal photographic journey. And at the end of that process, you might completely disagree with what I've said th uh, today. That's absolutely fine, of course. All I can ask and hope is that you at least consider what I've said, think about the ideas in respect of your own practice, and reach your own conclusions. That process, I think, is much more important than the ultimate stance that you take. Okay, so thank you for listening to me. Uh, now it's time to, for questions, I, assuming that you have any. What I will do is I will stop sharing my screen. Steve, thanks very much. Um, <laughs> God, you know, <clears throat> we joke a lot together when we're hanging out, but, you know, I do always learn something with you, whether I'm standing next to you or uh, on one of our many Skype calls. Um, uh, you, you, you do see things differently, and uh, there's never a day where I'm with you that I don't become a better photographer, so I appreciate that very much, and that was an excellent, I know I'm probably speaking for everybody, presentation. So, um Let's open it up for questions and answers. Uh, John, you, I'm going to let you take a look at the chats and see if there's anything there. And anybody yeah, only, um, at that point can unmute their microphone if they want to share it or, or ask a question. Comment, the only comment that came in during the, the chat was about his humor that is sometimes much worse. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me see if I can guess. Les Burke said that. Wrong. Yeah. Wrong, oh, Jeremy. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you live close enough for me to visit. Yeah. So just be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Heflin's asking, though, if you're primarily black and white, or do you have thoughts about black and white versus color? Um, I primarily see the world in, in black and white. Um, that's my sort of default vision. But that's not to the total exclusion of, of color. Um, 
when I'm looking at a scene, I always ask myself, does colour add anything to this scene? And if the answer is no, then it's a black and white shot. Um, but as I say, black and white is my default version. It's um, It may be uh, affected by the fact that I'm red, green, colour blind. Not significant. I, you know, I say that and people say, oh, what colour do you see grass? Well, of course, I see it green. But um, it's... Um, it may affect my um, my liking for for black and white. Um, I, I I do joke with my wife, um, and she has a similar sense of humour to mine. That um, I uh, I take black because I'm dependent on her colour vision. So when I was shooting slides, I used to put the slides on a light box, and having scanned them and have the image on the computer, and I I'd, I'd call her in and say, "Does this image on the screen look like like this?" slide and she would say oh it's a bit too red or it's a bit too yellow or, and i would adjust it until she said no that looks about right and um and so she's she has asked me in the past um with, with that in mind what how how comes you take so many black and white photographs these days steve and i say because it gives me options on the marriage front <laughs> Which uh, I say she's she's got a wicked sense of humor like mine. So anybody you feel sorry for her don't because she gives back much better than she gets. Oh, that's for sure. Steve and I have traveled with our wives together to the Faroe Islands and some other places. And um boy, she's one that can, you know, really put you in your place pretty quick. I nicknamed her Dewey a long time ago when I first met Steve, because I couldn't understand what Steve would say. He said, oh, I'm going to call Dewey and uh, tell her how things are going here. I said, Dewey, you have a wife named Dewey? And of course, her name is Julie, but Steve doesn't know how to say it properly in English, and it came out as Dewey in my ears. But when when he said this to me, I said, it's Julie, not Dewey. Dewey makes us sound like a cartoon character <laughs> or one of the dwarves. You know, it's Julie. And well, he, still, he still doesn't get it. No, I still don't get it. But you know what? She she, she gracefully uh, lets me call her Dewey every now and then. And um, she's a lovely oh, woman. And she stands by Steve holding umbrella over his camera for an hour while he takes one picture. She's amazingly dedicated to his cause. Wonderful, yes. wonderful person. Steve, do you have the chat open on the side there? You've got a lot of comments coming in about like Daniel Poiré is saying, gives a lot to think about. Robert Schumann said he's, he's become a better photographer in the last hour. All right, yeah. thank you. Oh, that, wow. That's, that's great. That's very kind. Well, I have to say, you know, I find that true because, I mean, I've been with Steve a lot of places and, you know, we, we might joke around a lot, but like I said, I, I become a better photographer too. Steve has a unique way of seeing. I bust his chops, he, he, you know, because he doesn't take color pictures and a lot of his pictures are blurry. But uh, now I've learned how to do blurry pictures in black and white, and um, I feel I've come a long way. And um, that's really... Yeah, Avril said she's sad about missing the start, but this is being recorded, so there will be a recording up on PhotoPixel soon. Yep. There's a number of good articles on PhotoPXL site, too, by Steve, and I believe we still have... You still have that Antarctica book? I think we have that in the in the store. If anybody wants to take a look at, the, yeah. yeah, still still got my lenses landscapes, which is a book of um, uh, pinhole landscape photographs, um, and I've got um, a beautiful silence, which is color and black and white photographs that I shot in South Georgia and Antarctica, and I have uh, Under African Skies, which is a book of small book of photographs I took on the safari in Botswana. And I also have a book called The Forgotten, which is a book of uh, infrared black and white images taken at an old overgrown Victorian graveyard in West Yorkshire. So, yeah, four, four books available. Is your infrared uh, digital or film? Uh, digital, yeah. Converted mm -hmm. Olympus uh, OMD mm -hmm. cameras, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. There, we have a few more comments, John. I see that there's a couple popping up here. Are you working on another book now? Um, not at the moment. Um, I, I, I will work on a couple of personal books, whether I make them available for sale, I'm not sure. One is of Venice, because I've visited Venice so many times, mm -hmm. probably a dozen times now, and I run a masterclass there usually once a year. Um, so I'd like to produce 
put some of my images into a into a book. And the other one is uh, Nidderdale, which is the dale that I said in the talk that I live in. Um, I've got so many images in Nidderdale that I'd like to put those into a into a book as well. But almost as a way of sort of um, uh, recording them for posterity, because I'm honest enough to know that when I die, um, my kids i still call them kids you know 37 35 and 32 but um we'll just take everything that i've ever produced down the tip um probably the cameras as well they won't even ask if the cameras have got any value they'll just go down the tip so to produce some books of some images um that are personal to me is a, a way of trying to preserve them beyond going to the skip but we'll see what do you what did you just call it the skiff or the tip well it's the tip it's the rubbish dump Oh, well, now I understand that. Yeah. The place where we put our trash. Yeah. Does okay. That, you understand that? Yeah. Yeah. We got it. We call it just play and call it the dump or the trash. The dump. Camp. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ian and Jeremy are both recommending a beautiful silence to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Steve, once again, um, we're, we'll, I want to say thank you. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to be shooting with you in a few weeks. That's going to be a, a blast, as it always is. Um, uh, it's truly a very great presentation you did. Um, I, I love the research. I know you work really hard on it, and um, I'm glad that we have this uh, recorded for posterity. And uh, it will be available on the site if anybody wants to be able to refer back to it at any time. Um, so, Steve, from... Uh, Myself and all of us here today, thank you again for uh, yes, inspirational and, and really, really good presentation. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you Absolutely. very much. Yay, I don't know if we can all clap at the same time, but it'll probably <laughs> gotta be unmuted. <laughs> thank you, Steve, that was awesome thank as you. usual. Thank yeah. you, thank, thanks to everyone for, for tuning in and for signing up and, and listening and, um, and for putting up with Kevin and his sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> hey steve what would happen in the faroe islands if i actually made you wait for me to finish taking a photograph hold on if you he'll you stand up he'll stand wait. around for the several seconds it will take and then we'll give him <laughs> yeah, that's, <right. laughs> that's true jeremy yeah well i i, in, I intend to, to do that one day i watched steve photograph um rope on a cleat that was holding a boat to a dock that took an hour while i was walking around shooting like 10 or 15 other really good pictures um, i was i was waiting for the light in that particular scene yeah but you could have walked around and come back when the light came you but you just sat there waiting for the light like it was just going to happen for a yeah, second then i'd miss it then i'd miss oh. it <laughs> <laughs> working with kevin reminds me of somebody i had on a workshop a few years ago and we were stood on a pier fairly early in the morning um taking landscape photographs and this guy was stood near me and i heard his camera going ka-ching 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 and i turned to him and he had it on you know 10 frames per second or something and i turned to him and i said david what are you doing he said i'm taking photographs i said but this is landscape photography you don't need to have it on 10 frames per second just work <laughs> out what you want to take and take one image and i said i tell you what your challenge for the rest of the day is wherever we go you just take one image not a thousand images because i said how many images have you taken since we've been out this morning and it was something like 1476 i don't take those in a year let alone in a in a morning and so later on in the day i went up to him and, and i could hear his camera going ka-ching 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 i said david david what happened to the one image per location and he said oh yeah i've taken that i'm taking the others now <laughs> uh, I, re I remember asking steve to go to antarctica with me and um he, he, he really was hesitant uh, so you know i would think that uh, a free trip to antarctica and actually getting paid to do it would be attractive to somebody and um, i had a few really good photographers um some that'll be here in a month or so uh just to speak with us that uh, were very hesitant to go to antarctica because it was out of their comfort zone which i found kind of like really amazing. And I know I remember standing there with Steve when he was looking at this immense landscape and it really did make you think different, didn't it? I remember it the, having a chat with you on the ice that one day. 
It did. Oh. It, it was a, it was a it was a incredible experience. Um, I mean, you taught me into leaving the tripod behind, and that was unknown before. <laughs> and you got me into bad habits. You know, I, when I went to Scotland last year, the, as you saw, the photograph I took with my apron and my pajamas on, you know, handheld. Um, so you got me into bad habits. I have no. to tell everyone that um, that trip to Antarctica, three three weeks on the ship. Um, I tried to talk my wife into coming. I said, come, it's a trip of a lifetime. You know, I'll pay for you to join us. And she said, there's no way I'm coming on that trip. And I said, why? What is it? The weather, the rough seas? She said, no, the thought of spending three weeks on a ship with you and Kevin Raber. <laughs> <laughs> I, my, my wife's done that trip with me and, you know, she didn't want to get off. So, but I, she's really nice. She's a really sweet person. And, um, I'm, I'm I'm lucky because I know that sometimes when I leave, she she's like, oh my God, thank God, I can do so much while he's gone. <laughs> she's probably looking forward to the Faroe Islands trips of two weeks without me. So, yeah, my dog will fine. be lonely though. All right, I'm yeah. going to stop the recording now. Um, once again, Steve, thank you very much. Uh, we can thank hang you. out for a minute here, but uh, we should stop the recording, and uh, which I'm going to do.